Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about building Swift packages with Visual Studio Code. Um, so a quick introduction before we get going. Um, I'm Tim. Uh, I run a company called Broken Hands, and we do kind of server-side Swift training and consultancy, so running training courses uh, and building and helping clients uh, implement server-side Swift solutions. <coughs> I, I'm on the Vapor core team, so I'm responsible for uh, fixing bugs in Vapor, maintaining the framework, and evolving it and pushing forward as Swift gains new features, uh, a new concurrency model, and lots of exciting new things that are coming up in the future. Um, I sit on the SSWG, which is the Swift Server Workgroup, uh, and we're responsible for advocating for Swift, uh, advocating for server uses of Swift uh, with the Swift team. So we speak to the, the core team, the compiler team, the package manager team, and kind of push them to implement stuff that will be useful for the server. Uh, and I'm the server-side Swift team lead at RayburnLick.com. So we have books and tutorials and videos on server-side Swift, so if you're interested, check them out, and plenty of iOS stuff on there as well. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Discord and Slack and GitHub and all the other socials as uh, 0xTim. Um, if you want to get in touch afterwards and give, ask some questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Uh, and I organize um, the server-side.swift conference. Um, so if you're interested in that, there should be some exciting news in the very near future. So, IDEs, uh, integrated development environments. We use them every day uh, for developing our applications. Um, but they've definitely changed over the years. <laughs> In the very, very early days of programming, you had something that looked like this, a punch card. And you had your stack of cards, and you had a little punch tool, and you actually had to go through and manually punch out all of the kind of bits of your code to produce your application. You then had these huge stacks, which you then put through the computer to generate the, uh, the result. Now, these are much quicker than kind of manually doing complicated maths equations, but as you can imagine, they're fairly slow to produce these cards, they're fairly error prone, and they also had bugs. And this is where the software term bugs come from, because you would get bugs caught in between the stacks of punch, down, uh, punch cards, uh, which would then introduce errors in the program, um, because they would, the program reading them would see the bugs, and that's why they're called bugs. So fun little fact there for you. So as time went on, uh, our tools got better. Uh, we evolved to writing kind of semi-human readable code um, in a text editor. Um, this is C, so not very human readable code. Um, but it was just a text editor. To build and run, we had to implement stuff from the command line. There wasn't kind of any integrated debugging or anything like that. Um, and so we iterated again. <coughs> For the sadists amongst you, um, you might have chosen Emacs or Vim, um, but why bother? Um, but for most of the people in this room, you'll be using Xcode. And Xcode is Apple's IDE for building uh, applications for Swift, Apple platforms, iOS, macOS, etc. And it's great. It's been built by with designers, and you can really tell, um, which makes it kind of nice to use. It has lots of features, like being able to debug. Um, you can view your code, you can view your views, you can have the interface builder to build your old school views. You have your Swift UI views for your new school views. Um, you get to view memory debugging stuff and view hierarchies and all that kind of stuff. And it's great, and it works really well for the most part. But sometimes you don't want to use Xcode. You might want to use another ID. And there are quite a, you know, a good number of reasons, of legitimate reasons, why you might not want to use Xcode. <coughs> to start with, you might be working in other languages. So you might be working on a big project that pulls in kind of a front end as well, where you're writing JavaScript or um, kind of other languages and HTML stuff. You might be working on, God forbid, React Native and having to write TypeScript. You might be working on Flutter or anything like that, or even Kotlin multi-platform, as we saw earlier. You might just want to open a file. And we've all been there, where you just want to kind of browse a view controller or a view or a data model, and you open it up, and it opens Xcode and then just spins there for kind of 20 seconds, resolving dependencies, pulling down the files. It's a waste of time, and it's slow. You might be working on different platforms. So Swift is a multi-platform language. It works on Linux and Windows. And so you might be building Swift pack packages for other um, platforms. And you might not be using a Mac. You might have another platform to build on. And you need an IDE to build that. 
Xcode has some limitations. Uh, one of the biggest annoyances for me is not being able to see hidden files and folders in the package view. Um, so I can't see my kind of GitHub workflows uh, or kind of any other hidden files, and that really annoys me. Um, and you can't kind of run in other environments as well. So if I want to kind of remote into a Linux terminal to be able to test some stuff on Linux, I can't do that in Xcode. And Xcode is big. We've all been there where it comes out and you download it and it's 12 gigs or something, and then you have to unzip it for half an hour, and then you have to install it, and then it, additional tools come up, and you have to install that, and then you plug your iPhone in, and it goes, preparing for watch development. I just wanted to view a file. So most people don't need Xcode with all, everything that Xcode brings in. So if you're building a Swift package, you don't need the iOS SDK. If you're building an iOS app, you don't need the macOS SDK. So for uh, some people, Xcode is too, too heavy. So what goes into building an IDE? So if we take a step back and look at Swift and kind of what we need to build an IDE for Swift, there are several parts. <clears throat> and they're all kind of part of the Swift um, package or the kind of the Swift um, ecosystem. So to start with, we have the compiler that kind of compiles your code and runs it. We have Swift Package Manager for putting down package dependencies and working out your different dependencies. There's Swift Test for running your tests, LLDB for debugging, and then we have SourceKit and SourceKit LSP for kind of doing things like syntax highlighting and auto completion. All these things you need. And if you're going to build an IDE, like say the uh, elusive Swift Studio, um, you need to kind of integrate all of these things into your, your IDE to make it work. So there's a lot that goes into it. And building uh, kind of a language plugin for any idea is quite a lot of work. So Visual Studio Code, I'm sure most people here have heard of it, but if you haven't, it was uh, created by Microsoft uh, a while ago now. It's open source. It's probably the most popular editor um, out there. Um, it looks kind of like this, um, which you probably can't see at the back, but it's, uh, it has a lot of features. Um, it's multi-platform, so it works on Windows and, and Linux, um, which is a big advantage. Um, it supports tons and tons of languages, so pretty much no matter what language you're working in, if it's JavaScript or HTML um, or Swift or Go or anything like that, there'll be a plugin for the language. And it has a fantastic extension ecosystem. So there are extensions for everything. If you want to prettify some JSON, there's an extension for that. If you want to minify some JSON, there's an extension for that. If you want to hook into Docker or different databases or kind of anything like that, there's an extension for that. Um, and it is a fantastic ecosystem. And it makes it really easy to build your own extensions. <coughs> and this is uh, Swift in Visual Studio Code, but we'll have a look properly later. So um, this is the Swift for Visual Studio Code extension. Um, it was launched uh, end of last year, start of this year, um, and originally created by um, some community members, um, and then it has been taken under the wing by uh, the SSWG. And it supports pretty much everything you'd expect. Syntax highlighting, code completion, test support, Swift package manager support, uh, and importantly, remote development support, which is a really kind of cool tool that I'll show you um, later on. So <clears throat> there are some caveats uh, to this and some fairly big ones as well for some people in this room. So to start with, you don't get any Apple-only framework support. So by this, I mean things like CoreML and AppKit um, and UIKit. Um, we use the Swift Package Manager from the command line effectively. Um, so if you can't compile your package with Swift Build, it won't work for you at the moment. And related to this, you can't build macOS and iOS apps um, because we can't hook into things like UIKit and you can't run the simulator, etc. There have been a, a couple of blog posts by some uh, people from the community who have kind of hacked together a bit of a solution to make macOS apps work. Um, and that's something that might evolve in the future. But for now, um, you can't build them. And we are focused predominantly on Swift packages. Um, so in the last kind of month or so, We've added support for individual Swift files. So if you're building Swift scripts, which we heard about earlier, um, you can open them up in uh, Visual Studio Code, and it will work, and you'll get your syntax highlighting and your code completion. And you can find all the weird kind of quirks of the process um, class to work out how you can pipe standard out and to see your um, kind of errors from AWS, for instance. And finally, um, I should mention it is pre-release. We're on 0.4 point something. It's not a 1.0 release. Um, so things, there are some bugs. 
Um, there are some bugs that I found last night when I was doing run-throughs uh, that I got fixed. There are some bugs that I found this morning that I have not got fixed yet. Um, so don't expect it to be perfect, but it does work for the most part, um, as we'll see. So I could talk about theory and all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to switch mics. Is this on? Hello? Hello? No. Wait for the mics to switch over. Any luck with the mic? No. Nope. Yeah, keep on going. There we go. Hey, we're back. Okay, so um, I have a, a little demo I pre prepared here. So I'm going to open. No, I'm not going to do that because that's I don't want to trust roots. Uh, that was the wrong thing to type. Okay, so. Hopefully that's visible to everyone at the back there. Um, I've kind of reduced the resolution so you should be able to see it. Um, but I have a Swift package here. It happens to be a vapor project. I had to sneak one of those in. Um, but it allows me to kind of demonstrate some things like debugging and stuff. So you can see here you kind of have your um, outline as you'd expect, similar to Xcode. Um, you can see you have your hidden files. Excellent. Um, you can see here you have your package dependencies, so you can see all the dependencies you're pulling in from Swift Package Manager. Um, and we even get things like outline support. So if I click through to the application, you can see here all the kind of outline of the application, the different classes, the different methods, the variables, etc. similar to how you have in, in the view in Xcode as well. Um, but it, it works in Visual Studio Code. Okay, let's close that. So, let me just get my notes up to make sure I don't miss anything for the demo. Okay, so, um, when you first open your package in uh, Visual Studio Code, it will automatically generate kind of targets and um, build settings for you. So, it's similar to how schemes are generated in Xcode, but the same thing works in Visual Studio Code. So, I can build everything, and that will go through and build my code for me. Um, builds it in debugging by default, so you get debugging support. Um, and that's actually already built because I had it built earlier. Now if I go to the run tab, you can see I have my different schemes. So if I want to de debug or release, I have that. And I can just run my code, um, and this runs my app. So I'm here in my debugging console. I also have my terminal output, um, so I can see my output. <coughs> and it works like you would expect. Anything, uh, anything else to work? The extension integrates really well with Visual Studio's Test Explorer. Um, so you can see here I have a single test. Um, so I can run my tests. And that works. And you have your test file. You can see you run individual classes. You can run individual tests and just click to run them like you'd expect. So none of this is particularly mind-blowing other than the fact it's working on Swift outside of Xcode, um, which I find quite cool. So I'm going to put a breakpoint in uh, my roots file. <coughs> and then run my tests. So, um, it breakpoints as you'd expect. Um, you get access to uh, your whole variable stack, so you can see everything that's on the request. My current context only has a single request that's passed into the closure, um, but you can see everything on that request. Uh, all the kind of different properties and stuff. Um, if I go to my debug console, I can print it out. It works. I can even kind of evaluate Swift code as well. And it works exactly the same as it does in Xcode. So if you need to write some expressions in Swift, um, it works really well. Um, the package, uh, the extension also supports C, C++, and Objective-C, because Swift Package Manager can build those. Um, so it works really well and integrates pretty well with those as well. So I'll just continue to make my test pass. OK, I'm going to create a new route. 
because I want to show um, how we can kind of switch between different environments, Linux, ver uh, Swift versions, and operating systems. So you can see here, I actually have an autocomplete coming up already. Uh, this is Visual Studio Code's uh, GitHub's Copilot co um, tool that kind of auto-completes code for you with AI. Um, some of it is scarily good, some of it's amusingly bad, um, but it is definitely getting better the more I use it. So the more kind of vapor code I write, the more it learns, um, and it will kind of generate kind of huge code blocks for me from things like comments and stuff, which is quite scary in a way, but quite cool. So you can see here, I've called my um, root handler here OS, and it's automatically suggesting that I return a string as the OS because I'm returning a string and getting the uh, operating system version from the process info. I've never written that piece of code before in my life. Uh, it must have come from somewhere else that it's kind of learnt from, uh, but that's kind of the kind of scary stuff it does. Uh, but that's not a really, this isn't really a demo about this kind of thing. Um, so you can see here, I have autocomplete. Um, it works, it's pretty stable, uh, kind of no major issues. Again, auto-completing, tab to complete, it's really nice. So I have a route here. Um, for any of you who haven't seen Vapor, it's basically quite a simple route. I'm going to send a request to get request to slash OS, and it's going to look and see what version of um, what kind of platform I'm running on. So if it's, going to, if it's running on Linux, it will return Linux. If it's running on Mac, it will return Mac. So my code's running. My server started. I head over to pour, I can send a request to OS, and you can see on the response on the right, it returns Mac. Great. So, <clears throat> none of this has been particularly groundbreaking. Uh, it's nice that it works, but for most people, why not just use Xcode? Um, so next, I'm going to show you how to use remote containers with Visual Studio Code. So this is a really, really powerful feature, one of the kind of best things about programming in Visual Studio Code. So obviously, I write a lot of server side Swift stuff. Um, and I need to test my stuff on Linux. I want to run on Linux. Sometimes there are some weird quirks on the Swift Linux um, stack that I need to test out. Spinning up a kind of virtual machine or getting an actual Linux box to kind of run those things on is painful and expensive. Um, and most people use Docker for this kind of thing. And, this, and Docker integrates really well with Visual Studio Code. So what I can do is, in any kind of Swift project or any kind of actual Visual Studio project, you can... Um, Go to the command palette, um, search for remote containers if you've installed the extension, and then click uh, or enter add development container configuration files. Um, I've already done this, so um, it will, it's already kind of asking me to overwrite it. But this will print out a dev container for you. Uh, there's some uh, configuration here. Um, this is pulled down automatically for you. We've set up uh, the Swift default stuff. Um, so you can choose your OS version, you can choose your Swift version, etc. Um, but essentially, it just runs a Docker container, um, installs Swift, um, installs some Node.js stuff so it can hook in and run the debugger stuff, uh, and that's it. So what I can then do is reopen the whole project in my dev container. So this basically creates a Docker container, starts it running, so I'm now running in Linux, copies my project over, um, and then I'm now running Visual Studio Code in Docker on my Mac, running as a Mac uh, a Linux program. So if I now run my program again, if I go back to Bohr, I can send my request. I've got my breakpoints already turned on. 
and you can see I return Linux. If I do that again, but turn the breakpoints on, um, so you can see here that I'm actually breakpointed and inspecting a program running inside a Docker container using LLDB on my Mac. I don't have to worry about spinning up virtual machines. I don't have to worry about trying to run this on a Linux box. Um, I can inspect this the same as before. I have all my variables. Um, I get LLDB so I can print them out without any issues. Um, and it's fantastic. So, <laughs> and that works for kind of any version. So if you want to switch to a different Swift version, uh, you can do that with a single command line change. So you can go to the uh, Remote Explorer, and then it kind of gives you a list of all the containers you've ever used. And I can run this in the Swift Heroes Nightly container, which is using Swift Nightly. Um, I was going to demo this, but the latest nightly of Swift has broken Vapor, so I can't demo that because there's a regression in the Swift compiler. Um, but trust me when I say if I was to open it in my uh, other dev container, um, you can see here I'm now running in Swift nightly Docker image. Um, I have my application. It just won't build. That's the only thing. Oops. Okay. So I've now switched back to my um, local environment, um, which is normally only a command away. I just accidentally closed Xcode, uh, VS Code, sorry. Um, so the final thing I want to demonstrate to you today is uh, opening multiple packages in a single workspace. I thought someone, someone had a question. Um, so I can uh, add a folder to my workspace. Uh, I'm going to pick. Uh, hello Vapor. And you can see I have my Swift Heroes demo project. And then down below I have my uh, Hello Vapor project. I don't know what you're doing. Oh, I'll just hide you off the screen and pretend you never existed. Um, and this works in exactly the same way. So this will again automatically generate my different run configurations. So you can see here it's generated run uh, debug and release run versions, uh, which and run is the name of my application. Um, for the two different projects. Um, I can choose which one to run. Um, I can, when I go to my build uh, options, I can choose to build the different projects, and it works exactly the same. If you try and do the same thing in Xcode, you'll get, generally get an error saying this project's already open in a different workspace, please close it and try again. Um, and so it's a much nicer development environment for working on multiple packages uh, side by side. Pretty sure that's all I have to demo, just double check. Yeah. Okay. So back to, back to the other one. <laughs> oh, there we go. Hey, we're back. Okay, cool. Um, so that was the demo. Um, so. Um, Kind of what the extension offers is um, an IDE that works across multiple platforms, so you can run on Linux. It mostly works on Windows, um, although we are looking for people to help test us, uh, test on Windows, because I don't have a Windows box, and the main developer doesn't have a Windows box. Um, and the other thing that I haven't been able to demonstrate today because of the Wi-Fi is um, it working in the browser. So GitHub have a thing called uh, GitHub Code Spaces, um, and this allows you to basically go to any repository on GitHub, um, and if you configure it, you can press uh, the um, point, um, full stop button, that's the one, um, and this will launch your kind of repository in a remote container running in the browser ready for you to use there and then. So you could be on your iPad in a different country, you could be uh, anywhere in the world um, and work on the, the project. Um, so if you have a really, really complicated setup, you can build this all in a Docker, a Docker container, push the Docker container up, and it will launch your project in seconds. Whereas if you have a big kind of monorepo, generally it takes ages to pull it down, you don't have to configure all the tools, you have to install Brew, you have to install Swift Lint and all that kind of stuff. Um, but this will work in seconds, and it really speeds up your development time. You can easily try out different versions of Swift, assuming Swift isn't broken. Um, so that's an M1 which means that unfortunately I can only try 5.6 and Nightly's because that's the only versions of Swift that have support for um, 
ARM Linux, um, but if you have an Intel Mac, you can run all the way back to like Swift 3 uh, if you really wanted to try out different versions. You can easily test on Linux to make sure it works. Um, so there, these days, generally, the, um, Linux and Mac are pretty much the same, but there still are still some odd quirks, and this makes it really easy to just kind of test a bug or work out what's going on. And it has great ecosystem support as well. So um, I have tons of extensions installed for things like uh, pulling down JSON, for integrating with databases, um, for formatting my code. Um, so there is an extension out there for anything you want to do, pretty much. And if not, it's really easy to build them. And this is kind of a personal aim, which I should probably caveat that with. Um, but the aim of the, the plugin or the extension is to provide a better experience for developing Swift packages than Xcode itself. Um, this is all open source, Visual Studio Code is open source, um, and we can iterate quicker than the Xcode release cycle. So if we have bugs, we generally get them fixed pretty quickly. Um, these days, if you have bugs in Xcode, unfortunately, you have to file a radar, oh, sorry, a feedback, um, and wait for it to be fixed in the next release, hopefully. Um, this is all on GitHub, so you can track any problems, help contribute if you really want. So some future aims for the project. Um, we are now getting to a stage where kind of all the big features are implemented, uh, which is really cool. Um, one big thing we're looking at is code coverage. Um, Visual Studio Code are currently going through a bit of a transition period where they're creating their own code uh, coverage plugin and tab that we'll then need to hook into, so we're holding off for now. Um, we want full Windows support. Um, so most things kind of work on Windows, but there are a few edge cases um, because we can't test it on Windows. Um, so if any of you are interested and have Windows boxes, please try it out and let us know. Um, you can raise issues on GitHub, it'd be fantastic. So yeah, if you have an idea for something that we're missing or that would be cool, again, just let us know and we'll be happy to talk about it. Uh, so finally, special mention. Uh, first person is Stephen Van Impe. Um, he is the original person who kind of spun this out um, as a kind of a community project. He built the package dependency view and the first initial integrations. Um, and then Adam Fowler, who sits on the SSWG with me, um, he's the main developer behind this. He's been running, um, writing all of the code, and I just review the PRs. Um, and then get to talk about it on stage. Uh, he's the person who actually does all the actual work, so full praise should go to him. Thank you very much.